let's see. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the kind invitation, and it's a pleasure to talk to you about the biological function of uh, fluorescent proteins, or at least about these aspects we know so far. And this uh, school is, is mostly about um, applications and the biophysics and the biochemistry of these pigments. But I think it's, it's very important also to look at their functions in nature because that um, can clarify um, at least to some extent why they do what they do and why we can exploit these features for imaging application. So I want to take you just a step back, so um, where I came from. So, so my interest in these fluorescent proteins started with a um, profound love for sea anemones. Uh, so you can see here some examples of snake lock anemones, which are um, coming in different color variants. So you can see some greens and some brown ones. And I was um, asking the questions, why are they so colorful? Because back then it was thought that it was due to the symbiotic algae that recede inside of the tissue. So why do they have these different colors and they occur side by side? So this is the question I was um, um, thank you. This one? Yeah. So this was my starting question and um, I want to take this opportunity also to um, thank my mentors at this stage who made actually um, this research possible because I went to them and said, okay, I, I'm interested in this question. Would you like to take me on for that? And uh, that was um, Werner Funke and Walter Vogel who then um, hosted me for my diploma thesis um, in the lab where I looked at the distribution of these color variants in various sea anemones. And as part of this uh, research, I found that these co um, color varieties are actually not just colorful, but they are also fluorescent. And interestingly enough, among them, there were some red fluorescent um, pigments. And that was just the time when, when GFP started to become famous. So um, I was obviously then very interested in uh, these red fluorescent proteins. And that is what I did then uh, during my uh, PhD thesis in the lab of Klaus uh, Spindler that I started um, to clone these pigments. And later on, I um, started a very fruitful collaboration with um, Uli Nienhaus, and um, I want to thank him in particular uh, for teaching me how to become a professional scientist, because that was uh, ra really his big experience in the field that taught me um, how to move forward. So thank you to all of them for making this possible. I moved then on to the University of Southampton where my um, research became more biologically focused and here we are um, working on um, corals and sea anemones, uh, various aspects of their biology and we are doing this mostly in um, controlled lab environments. As part of this work we are looking for example at um, the adaptation of corals to, to extreme temperatures for which we are um, studying corals in the, in the Persian Gulf where they survive summer temperatures of up to 35 degrees on an annual basis. So that can teach us a lot how such systems behave um, under extreme stress that we are expecting um, as a result of climate change. And then another uh, big project is the effect of nutrient enrichment on the functioning of this um, coral algal um, association. However, today I want to talk about my uh, research into the biological function which I kept um, going over all these years and it's in the meantime I just calculated back earlier this morning. It's 23 years um, that I'm looking in this question and, and slowly we, we think we were starting to understand what is going on. And I want to present you some of these ideas today um, and starting with the introduction of the coral algal symbiosis, which is really at the key of understanding the function of the pigments in these groups. So I want to uh, um, sh talk about photoprotection in shallow water corals and how these uh, pigments are regulated by an optical feedback loop. And that can explain some of these stunning color patterns that we find in reef corals. Um, then I want to talk about other functions the light enhancement um, for the symbiotic algae in a mesophotic coral environment, um, and then about color polymorphism. So my initial starting question, so why are there some individuals which are brightly colored, whereas others are essentially non-pigmented? 
And then I want to speculate at the end at some other functions. So first of all, um, about coral color. So here we have a, a scleractinian coral, so stack on coral, and it's uh, very brown. And this brown coloration is due to the alto symbionts, they are dinoflagellates that sit inside the tissue of the corals. Being photosynthetic organisms, these um, flagellates, they have um, peridinine and chlorophylls as photosynthetic pigments, and that gives them the color, and this color then shines through the transparent tissue of the host animal, and that renders the coral brown. So if we look at the microscopic level, so here's a cross-section of coral tissue uh, photographed by their own fluorescence, and we can see here there's this thin layer of, of ectoderm, and then we have two gastrodermal layers, and the red chlorophyll fluorescence indicates the presence of the symbiotic algae. So they're forming a rather thick layer inside of the coral tissue, and they're sitting inside of the coral cells. So why do they... Um, go into the symbiosis, so it's clearly because they live mostly in very nutrient-poor environments. So blue is the desert color of the ocean, so uh, because there's not many nutrients, there's not a lot of phytoplankton, and as a result, the water color is blue and very clear. And that is clearly a problem if you want to um, acquire food. So the corals have invented the symbiosis to basically to tap into two different nutrient pools. So the animal host, they can feed on, on zooplankton. So there's not a lot of um, plankton around, but there's a little bit, and they can eat it. Um, so they take up particulate nitrogen and phosphorus, they, they digest these um, um, prey items, and then they produce some inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus waste, which then they use as fertilizer for their alpha symbionts. So there's a very um, tight recycling of um, nutrient products in this symbiotic association. On the other hand, the, the symbiotic algae, they can take up dissolved inorganic nutrients from the water, which would not be otherwise accessible to the coral host. And they take them up, they um, turn them into organic compounds, and this is from which also the host benefits. So, so this is all about um, maximal exploitation of nutrients, and that explains in part this um, so-called Darwin paradox that coral reefs are thriving in, in regions where there's obviously not a lot of um, primary production and nutrients around. So and then together, these two organisms, the, the coral host and the alpha symbionts, they make up these huge structures, for example, here, the Great Barrier Reef, that can be seen from space, and that is home to all this um, huge biodiversity. So coral reefs, they are taking up only 2% of the seafloor, yet they host about 25% of all marine biodiversity. So if the corals are exposed to various forms of stress, most prominently heat and light stress, then this um, symbiotic association breaks down, um, the algae are lost from the tissue, and uh, as a result, the white limestone skeleton shines through the animal tissue, and that gives the corals this white appearance, and that has lent them the na uh, name to the term coral bleaching, which is now um, quite abundant and frequently on the news, especially in, in 2015 and 16, when there were large El Nino events, there were temperature anomalies that led to global coral bleaching. If that happens at a larger scale, whole reefs can actually lose their symbiotic algae, and if the corals don't um, manage to recover these symbionts, um, they will die sooner or later, and then the reef is, as it is a whole biological structure, is prone to erosion and it um, quickly um, degrades, and then this three-dimensional framework is lost that is required to sustain all the other diversity. So, so this is um, a, a former Acropora stackhorns um, coral stand um, 15 years after a massive bleaching event, so it's um, essentially a flattened structure. But then um, corals have not only these brownish tones that come from the alpha symbion, but th um, they have also a number of very vibrant colors, and this is what we are all interested in. So these are all um, pigments of the 
um, GFP-like protein family. And they are not only fluorescent, some of them, uh, they are brightly colored, so they absorb a lot of light of certain wave bands, but then they are not um, um, giving fluorescence back. So these are the groups of so-called chromoproteins. So we've seen that already, and we will certainly hear more about it, so I don't want to go into that. So the really the important point also for today is that this is a genetically encoded um, form of um, pigment production where you just need a single gene to produce one pigment, which is ve very, very unusual. Usually you need a whole biochemical pathway to end up with a pigment. In this case, it's just a single gene, or as we will see later, several. Um, and these um, genes give rise to diversity of colors, also, we have heard about that already. And it's not only the engineered um, proteins that come in different colors. There's also a big um, color vari variability also among the natural occurring forms. So after this introductory part, I want to move on now to the um, photoprotection um, aspect of um, coral pigmentation. And this was already recognized by a Japanese scientist um, uh, Kawaguchi in the 1940s where he studied this pigmentation and he was actually proposing that um, they might um, serve as, as sunscreens for the corals and their symbiotic algae. But um, as people started looking deeper into that, uh, a lot of doubt arose whether this hypothesis was true. And um, as I can show you, um, indeed he was um, right. So we looked at um, this in various um, reef corals and our starting point um, where we s thought, okay, it is probably something to do with light is when we started looking where are these pigments expressed. So in this case, this is a stack on coral and we can find that the pigment expression occurs um, more or less exclusively in the light exposed part of the colony. It's also quite well visible here. Wherever there's light on the colony, you get this um, expression of red fluorescent and pink um, chromoproteins, and in the shaded parts of the colony, there's essentially no pigments. So that um, suggests that it has something to do with the light. And we could um, verify that at the molecular level. So in this case, we used a semi-quantitative PCR approach. So we looked at the level of transcripts um, that are encoding these um, fluorescent proteins and we studied them in corals that were um, exposed to um, light of different color but um, it's the same intensity, so the same photon fluxes. And what we could see quite clearly is um, that the um, expression of this gene is upregulated in the blue spectral wavelength. So, so they um, um, respond to the intensity of the blue light. And if we look at the optics of these corals, we find something rather interesting. So, so in this case, we um, used this um, seriatopora um, coral, and we recorded the spectra um, of the coral in the living association. And what you can see here, the brown graph is the, um, the absorbance of the, of the shaded part of the tissue, and this pink line is the light exposed part. So, so there are clear difference in the absorbance and if we um, look at the difference um, we find that this more or less matches perfectly the absorption spectrum of this pink chromoprotein that sits in the um, expressing light exposed part of the coral. And we can also then conclude that actually this whole part of the absorbance is taken away by the um, chromoprotein that sits on top of the algal cells. So, so they really very efficiently reduce light of certain wavelengths. What was always puzzling was that uh, they absorb in a region where chlorophyll and peridinine don't absorb very well. So one should think that um, light in these particular wave bands should not be particularly harmful because chlorophylls don't absorb it. But um, very specifically, um, these chromoproteins sit in this particular region. 
So one of my PhD students then tested this hypothesis that there might be a photoprotective effect despite um, these wavelengths not being very absorbed. And here we looked at color morphs. So, so these are um, representatives of the same species, but they are hugely different in the expression levels of um, chromoproteins. So here this one is brightly colored because it expresses up to 10% of the total protein in the cell um, is actually um, chromoproteins. So in contrast, the other um, individual expresses essentially no um, chromoproteins. So here the coloration is essentially only due to the presence of the algal symbionts. So and then the came the LED technology and, and that um, really allowed us to, to start playing with, with these wave bands and we found an LED that matches very well the absorption spectrum of this particular chromoprotein in Acropora valida. So we then took um, samples of the two color morphs and exposed them to this specific LED light and then we measured uh, the outcome for the photosynthetic efficiency. So what we did is that we took branches of the corals and then we illuminated them from above where they are mostly pigmented by the chromoprotein and from below where they essentially um, don't show any expression. And then we did that for both of the color morphs. And what we can see that um, in the pigment morph, there's no difference in coloration um, when we expose them to these stress levels whereas the lower side of the branch where they don't have these chromoproteins, the algae symbionts, they bleach, so, so, so they um, are lost from the tissue and as a result, the corals appear bleached. So in the brown morph that doesn't have the, the chromoproteins, we see um, bleaching in both parts of the branches, in the upper side and in the lower side. So this is um, a good indication that the um, purple chromoproteins are actually um, taking away some of this radiation that could otherwise become harmful for the algal symbionts. And that works not only for the chromoproteins, but also for um, cyan fluorescent proteins. This is another coral, Hydnophora. And again, we took the opportunity to work with different color morphs. So, so there's some of them which are expressing um, fluorescent proteins at hi very high level, whereas others are only expressing them at very low levels. And in this case, we found another LED that matches the excitation band of the cyan fluorescent protein. And then we illuminated these corals with high intensities, so with, with a photon flux which you find usually in the very shallowest parts of the reef and we expose them there for about three weeks and what we can see is then again um, here the area where the LED was shining on in the low fluorescent morph um, we see this bleaching so the algae symbionts are lost from the tissue whereas in the highly fluorescent morph um, we essentially see only a mild paling. So this could be anything essentially because um, there are many other factors, so, so they are not exactly the, the um, same individuals. So as a control, we treated them both um, corals with orange light. So from our previous experiments, we knew that orange light has this harmful effect on the symbionts. And if we assume that in this case, the absorption around 470 nanometer is really critical for screening, then we shouldn't see this effect when we illuminate the corals with orange light. So that's what we did. So we um, focused a spot of orange light on the corals and as you can see here, both of them are bleaching now. And uh, this confirms that this bleaching is really an optical effect. So in this case, the screening through the high amounts of, of these fluorescent proteins helps to reduce the amount of light stress um, for the algal symbiont. And interesting to note is um, that uh, this experiment has also confirmed that orange light is particularly harmful for um, the photosynthesis of these algal symbionts because this effect we achieved after illumination of the corals for about three weeks. These effects um, for the orange lights we saw after six days. So um, in fact, it's, it's very 
um, harmful, um, and this is why we also think nature has evolved specifically these chromoproteins which um, cover this specific orange wave band. And now that we know that um, there is photoprotection um, in uh, corals, uh, we can also use that to explain some of the distribution patterns that have been observed earlier in the field. So this is uh, work of, of Anya Sali and um, colleagues, and they um, just looked at the distribution of various um, colored and non-colored corals in the field. And what they saw is that um, the highest amount of, of fluorescence and um, presence of chromoproteins is found indeed in the most shallowest part of the reef. So in a depth of about one meter, so at right at the top of the reef crest, there's essentially um, no real um, non-fluorescent corals. So all of them are essentially expressing one form of chromoprotein or fluorescent proteins. And as you go deeper, the proportion of colored corals um, decreases with increasing depth. So um, there's a lot of color diversity around and that has also uh, led to heated um, discussions on the function of these pigments. But if we understand how these pigments are regulated, we can also explain um, some of these um, rather stunning um, expression patterns and um, we can slowly understand that it indeed makes sense also in um, terms of photoprotection. So one of the observation was for example if corals become damaged, so here you have some um, stack on corals and they have been abraded so, so there was some mechanical stress and then these damaged areas they turn blue and that indicates a high level expression of of the blue chromoproteins. Or another observation was that um, when corals are infested by, by other organisms, by some, some parasites or epibions, uh, then they suddenly start to express um, certain fluorescent or chromoproteins. And what you can see here is a microscopic um, picture of a poritis coral. So you can hea see here the individual um, coral polyps, they are expressing a green fluorescent protein and only in this one spot where there's no polyp you find the expression of some red fluorescent protein. And when we had a closer look we saw that this very um, spot was inhabited by a, a little crustacean. So obviously the coral responded to the presence of this um, foreign organism by expression of um, a different type of fluorescent protein. So, and people were always arguing, okay, if you have that, how can that be photoprotective? So that has nothing to do with photoprotection. So we tried to um, reproduce these um, color changes in the lab and we uh, used the Acropora pulchra and we scraped off part of the tissue at the base of the, the coral. And then we saw that indeed, um, with a time of about three weeks, this tissue turned um, purple and blue, as we saw it in the uh, damaged areas of corals in the field. And if we look at the area under the microscope, we can see here, yes, there's a strong expression of a blue chromoprotein, but there's also um, very pronounced changes in the expression of, of green fluorescent proteins in the polyps. So in this area, uh, the tentacles of the polyps, they are brightly green fluorescent. So then we had a look at the other parts of the coral colony and we can see that in the growing tips of the corals, we find exactly the same expression pattern. So we have a high level of um, blue chromoprotein expression and um, high levels of green fluorescence in the tentacles of the polyp where the um, corals are actively growing. So since these are the growth zones, we speculated um, that this may have something to do with the growth of the tissue. 
So is this indeed an area where the coral is actively growing? So yes, if we damage a tissue, one would think that there should be some um, accelerated growth, but we try to um, confirm that at the molecular level. And uh, so this was done in collaboration with one of our uh, colleagues from, from medicine. Um, and we used a marker for cell proliferation, the so-called proliferating cell nuclear antigen. And that is um, used, for example, to characterize um, breast cancer cells because um, in these particular cells, uh, this protein acts as a processivity factor for DNA polymerase. So if the cells are uh, replicating, uh, they are producing more of this protein to actually synthesize DNA um, to support the dividing uh, cells. And that can be used subsequently as an indicator for high level of cell division in a tissue. So we cloned this protein from, from corals and we found that it's surprisingly um, conserved. So it's um, very similar to the um, corresponding forms from, from, from humans um, and from, from Hydra and Xenopus. And then we looked at the expression levels. So first we quantified the amount of the um, chromoproteins and the fluorescent proteins in the um, growing tip area of the coral um, in the major part of the branch where we don't um, see this color pattern. And then we took the same samples from this area of regeneration and looked at the um, pigment concentration. And as we can see, um, that confirms fully the visual impression. So the pigment levels in the growing tip and in the regenerating areas are essentially the same and they're much lower in the um, rest of the colony. And if we then analyze the, the PCNA as a marker of cell prolif proliferation, we find that um, this pattern is uh, reproduced here. So we find higher levels of um, cell proliferation in the tip. So this is the growth area of the coral, so that makes sense. But we also find um, e um, elevated levels in the regenerating area which makes also sense because the tissue needs to grow back and apparently it does that at the higher speed than it would do normally. So those color changes can be indicative of regeneration processes. So we um, can now take some of the uh, lessons that we learned during the application um, back to the coral reef and use these um, markers as indicators of certain biological processes in corals. And that is a quite frequent phenomenon. So you can see here um, the growth margins of a plate-like coral. And again, we see high levels of um, chromoprotein expression in these growing zones. And if we then look at areas that are infested with a uh, sessile snail, so, so this is a l almost looks like a tube worm, but in fact, it's a sessile snail that sits on the coral. And um, here we see that the coral actually covers this shell of the snail and it shows um, the chromoprotein in the um, highest parts and the same also when these snails infest our model coral Acropora. And if we look again at the fluorescence, we see the, the same pattern, um, high amount of chromoprotein uh, chromoprotein and high levels of green fluorescent in the polyps. So we know now that this indicates accelerated growth. So what may be the function? And if we look closely um, and break up these infested areas that we can see that the coral grows around these um, parasites. It deposits a skeletal material on top of them. So the biological function is very clear. So it's about um, neutralizing these parasites by accelerating growth and just trying to run over them. So in the, <coughs> the local accelerated growth is then part of the, the innate immune response of coral. So it's a very basic form of immune response. And the sunscreening um, we will see in the next part um, 
is essential for this um, function. So, and this is why I want to um, move on to the next section. So this is a, a reef which is heavily infested by parasites and you can see even at the reef scale um, they can change the color completely by expressing high levels of chromoprotein that suggests they are very actively defending themselves against the parasites. So and if we want to understand the function in this context and how um, sunscreening can play a role, um, we look again at our model system and do this in a schematic form. So we have here the, the ectodermal layer, then we have the two layers of um, endoderm where the symbiotic algae sit, uh, then we have the outer part of the, the ectoderm that sits directly in contact with the coral skeleton. So you remember from the previous um, photograph that the coral skeleton is, is made out of limestone. It's perfectly white, so it's actually a very good reflector. So any light that goes onto this uh, white surface is essentially reflected completely, and this is why the corals appear white. And this is also what um, would happen here. However, the incident light is mostly absorbed in the blue and also in the green region by the photosynthetic pigments of the algae symbionts. So not none of the light reaches far down into the, the tissue. And this is why the corals appear mostly brown. However, if the symbionts are lost or not present in the tissue, uh, these this light penetrates very well through the transparent tissue of the coral. It hits the white reflector, that is the coral skeleton, so it's bounced back and scattered and is distributed around in the tissue. And that is also um, clearly measurable in the, um, by the reflectance of the coral. So, so we looked at the reflection of um, corals that are um, bleached and non-bleached, and we can see here in the bleached corals, um, the reflection is substantially higher, in the especially in the blue parts of the spectral region. And we know that this can then be harmful for the algae symbionts. So um, any symbionts that sit um, as single cells in this um, environment would experience high levels of light stress. And at the same time, we know that um, these pigments are upregulated by the presence, uh, by the amount of, of blue light that is going into the tissue. So what is happening is as soon as the corals lose their symbionts or if they are symbiont free in the first place, um, the high level of blue light in the coral tissue switches on the expression of the um, pigment genes in the ectodermal layer. So as a result of that, um, we get a reduction in the spectral band that corresponds to the absorption of the chromoproteins. And that allows then the algae symbionts to move in gradually. Once they establish themselves, they start taking away mostly the blue light, which is responsible for the expression of the pigment genes. So and as a result, once the um, the symbiosis is fully, fully established, um, the pigment expression in the ectodermal layer is switched off. So and that can then explain the changes in colors in the corals. So before I move on um, to the light enhancement in mesophotic core, shall we make a five minute break or shall we go through what, what is your plan? Shall we, shall we move on or? Yeah, okay, good. Sure. Um, it it's not clear yet. So, 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 so we have confirmed that now in, in a series of other experiments and we have been discussing that over dinner yesterday. So, so because it, it, it's really not um, obvious why this should be the case because the absorption cross-section is rather low, so the amount 
um, of light that is absorbed by the chlorophylls is um, low. So, so one um, effect could be that it penetrates very well. So, so uh, um, especially because of the absorption not being high, it can penetrate very well into the layer of symbiont tissue. And when it is absorbed, then it may exert um, some photoinhibition. So are there other questions? Robert? Well, so, so they absorb in the, in the blue wave band and, and there's a number of um, photoreceptors that could be responsible. So cryptochromes, for example. No, so, so it could be any of those um, that absorb in the, in the blue region of the spectrum. Well, this would be certainly interesting, but so, so we have thought about it, but at the moment it's um, not actively done. So, so we are having a proposal now submitted that looks at the effect of light pollution, and we want to uh, um, touch on this aspect in the in this course of the proposal if it gets funded. But if you are have an interest, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm very um, open to, uh, to discuss whether one could do something, because it, it's obviously an interesting question in terms of photobiology. You have some? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Okay, so um, that was now the um, expression of these pigments in shallow water corals, and um, parts of the um, controversial discussion in the past was also um, that uh, corals are not only colorful in the very shallow parts of the reef, but you find also um, colorful corals um, deeper. So we uh, studied this in the Red Sea, which is a very um, good place to do that because the water is very clear, so light penetrates very deep into the water. And accordingly, um, there's a lot of coral life also further down in greater depths. And in fact, in the Red Sea, you can find corals to depths about 160 meters. So, so the symbiotic corals, they can extend very deeply. However, the communities are very different at this greater depth. So that was done in collaboration with um, the group of Yossi Loya and mostly with Gal in this context. So where we looked at various uh, corals from greater depths, 30 meters downwards, and um, indeed, as you can see here in this series of pictures below, they are also brightly fluorescent. And in this case, you see their natural fluorescence. So, so in this case, um, they were not excited with a blue light torch as, as people commonly do it, but um, they were just photographed with one of these yellow filter lenses in front of the camera that actually takes out the blue um, light of the, the excitation. Um, in this case, this is just the natural environment. Because um, as you know, um, the attenuation of red light happens very rapidly in, in water. So essentially at a depth of 15 to 20 meters, you don't have any red-orange light in the underwater uh, spectrum. And it's essentially all concentrating down to a uh, cyan blue region. And this light obviously excites the fluorescence of these pigments. And if you then photograph them through a yellow filter lens, um, taking out the blue component, then you can see clearly that this light, so the natural um, light, stimulates the fluorescence. So the, the question was what m may be the function of these um, particular fluorescent proteins in this context. So again, we um, looked in the aquarium and then also in the field. And what we saw is um, that there was a particular increase in red fluorescent um, colonies as you go deeper. So in the very shallow waters, you've essentially find no red fluorescent colonies. And as you go deeper, the, the amount of these uh, red fluorescent um, calls becomes more and more. So it's a completely the opposite picture that we saw from these um, calls expressing photoprotective um, pigments in the shallows. And our study um, objects were 
uh, they cause lobophilia and echinophilia, and they are known also from other contexts. So the first thing we observed was that among these calls from these weak light environments that the expression of these genes is not um, regulated by light. So in this case we used uh, the call Mont Astrea Cavernosa um, and this call has one of these photoconvertible um, chi, the EOS type um, proteins. And the, the expression levels, they are exactly the same um, when you expose them to strong and to weak light. So again, this um, already suggests that the function of these pigments are completely different. And also if you uh, live deeper in the reef, there's not such a um, high amount of light. So um, it makes sense not to respond to this um, form of environmental cue. So this is the, as I already mentioned, the, the changes in the underwater light climate as you go deeper. So you can see here um, the spectral distribution um, from the surface waters, zero meters down to 100 meters. And you can see here, you do not only lose a lot of intensity, so the light levels don't go down, just um, do not only go down very rapidly, but also the spectral composition changes dramatically. So you um, lose all the orange red um, wave bands and you also lose the short wavelength and as a result you have a um, at depth already at 10 meters a very narrow banded uh, blue light that is centered around 465 nanometers. So if we look back at the, the coral, um, the ectodermal layer which contains the fluorescent pigments mostly and then the gastrodermal layers which contain the symbiotic algae. And if we look at the absorbance of the symbion containing tissue, we find that um, there is a very pronounced absorbance in the region of 465 nanometers. So and that is exactly where the environmental light environment peaks. So one could think, okay, it's fantastic. So, so this is where the symbionts absorb best. So they should be perfectly adapted to this light environment. However, what we see in this case, we get an increase of red fluorescence and, and this uh, fluorescence is specifically centered around 580 nanometers. So it's actually very well away from the major absorption of the, the symbiotic algae. So what may be the function for that? So and what we tested then whether this may facilitate the penetration of light into these um, thick symbiont tissues. And what we did for this um, purpose, we took a disc anemone, we fixed it and then we cut it in half and then we photographed under the microscope um, at the cross section. So, so, so we can see, and this is what you see here, is the symbiotic layer very much magnified and then we illuminated it with um, the same amount of uh, photons at different wavelengths. And then we recorded the fluorescence of the chlorophyll from the symbionts. So what you can see here are slices that are um, of the same area under different excitation lights. And you can see here at 400 nanometers up to 480, 500 nanometers, uh, you find that the chlorophyll fluorescence takes place mostly in the uppermost layer of the symbionts. And only if, if you move then into the green-orange window, um, you see that the fluorescence occurs deeper in the tissue. So in fact, um, these wavelengths um, penetrate deeper because they are not absorbed in the first place by the symbiotic algae. And then they hit some algae cells deeper in the tissue. And for, for photosynthesis, it's essentially um, not such a big difference if you absorb an orange or a blue photon in terms of, of the photosynthetic outputs. And since they are very dense, they are highly pigmented, the probability that the light um, will be absorbed at the end is high. So by transforming the light from blue into orange, the corals enables uh, the penetration of light 
deeper into the tissue. And then we have discussed that already earlier, they do have this white um, reflector skeleton. So even if the photon is not absor ab absorbed by, uh, by, uh, during the first passage the th through the tissue, it is reflected by the tissue, it comes back, and eventually it will be absorbed. So, so there's no loss in terms of absorption. And we studied this um, using uh, the coral lobophilia, so, so because those are some of the corals that occur deeper into the reef and where we find this um, red fluorescence. And um, this coral uh, gave rise to ESFP, and um, if it's expressed in the first place, it's green, and only if we shine a short pulse of violet light on it, it turns irreversibly to a red fluorescent protein. So, and um, we will probably hear more about that. Uh, so this is some of the work that we have done together with, with Uli Nienhaus, and um, at the structural level, we find that this break in the peptide backbone results then in the modification of the chromophore and this rather substantial shift toward the red end of the spectrum. As we heard already, um, EOS FPS, most of the other anthocyan FPs, they are occurring as tightly packed tetramers. And this is a um, very interesting observation that um, Uli's group made early during these studies when they looked at single molecules, is that you find these um, interesting switching patterns. So, so what you see here is a immobilized single EOS FP molecule that is excited, and then the emission is traced in both in the green and in the uh, red channel. And what one can see is, um, as soon as there is some red emission happening, the green emission goes down completely, and as soon as the red emission goes away, the green comes up again. So, and this can be explained by a very pronounced intramolecular threat. So, uh, since these um, monomers are very tightly packed together, they are perfect threat pairs. And what you can see here is essentially um, a, s a sequence of photoconversion and switching. So what is happening first is um, if you get one conversion event, um, this red chromophore acts as acceptor for all the other green chromophores and takes up essentially all of the energy. If that bleaches, the red, uh, the green fluorescence of the donor molecules comes up again, and that goes on um, until at the end all of the um, the monomers within this assemblage are bleached and you end up in a dark state. And what this also shows that this is a 100% efficient threat. So because as soon as red comes up, all the green is gone, and as soon as red goes down, all the green comes up again. So it's a very efficient threat coupling within these tetramers. So we were um, trying to uh, understand whether this also may play a role in the functioning of these proteins in the coral animal, and this is um, part of Elena's uh, PhD project. And so she took Mount Astrea Cavanosa and um, kept the corals under different um, light environments, so um, under violet light, so light conditions that promote the conversion of these um, pigments from green to red, at some blue um, where we find parts of um, for the conversion happening, and then in under cyan light where we should essentially not get any conversion. And in fact, this is very well reflected by the um, fluorescent properties of the coral. So after several weeks, um, if they don't have these violet wavelengths that are required to induce um, for the conversion, the corals actually go green. And um, if you keep them under violet light only, they're um, very red. And, and in the blue light, which represents uh, more the, the natural um, environment, um, we get a mix of both. So, so indeed, um, in the natural setting, we get a mix of half-converted or um, partially converted fluorescent proteins, and that is very well reflected in the spectrum. So our hypothesis was then whether FRED may actually be a mechanism to 
uh, transform the blue light that is prevailing at greater water depths into the orange light that can then penetrate deeper into the coral tissue. And for that purpose, we then um, exposed coral um, under um, low light, blue light conditions that simulate a mesophotic environment. And we me measured the threat derived emission. So, so we looked specifically at the um, orange fluorescence that was pr produced via threat. And what we can see by measuring that in the coral tissue is that we get a um, substantial increase over time. So there is obviously a, a equilibrium between the, the green and the red chromophore that is adjusted then in a way that allows a very efficient threat conversion of the blue light um, to the orange light. So, and um, we tested then whether this is the best way to do it because there's also plenty of red fluorescent proteins around. So why not just using red fluorescent protein? So in this case, we compared um, EQFP611, which is among the, the brightest red fluorescent proteins. And we looked how much red light can we get out of this protein if we excite it with um, blue light around 465 nanometers, so wavelengths that are um, dominant in deep water environments. And then we did that with um, various forms of partially converted EOSFP and compared the amount of, of um, red light that we can generate by this. And as you can see from this graph, um, it, it's really s a striking um, higher amount uh, of, of orange red light that one can generate via this threat transformation as compared to a, a direct excitation of a red chromophore um, that you find in, in calls such as um, endacmea uh, quadricolor. So we tested then in, in the aquarium um, whether this indeed can have an ecologically significant um, response. And again, we made use of this natural um, color morph. So, so, so we took um, representatives of echinophilia um, that doesn't express these um, photoconvertible proteins and some representatives who express these pigments in high amounts. So then we exposed them to low levels of blue light for a long period of time. And this is the beautiful thing about um, having a good aquarium facility that you can set up these experiments and, and leave them there. So, so doing something like that in a field setting would be very difficult. But um, here we just could leave it and over 12 months um, essentially nothing happened. But then just after we observed that the brown ones, um, which are not expressing these pigments, they started slowly to die. So, and um, they are, um, were lost um, in the course of two years, whereas the red fluorescent ones, they survived very well. And that uh, kind of supports that this wavelength transformation helps to uh, improve the light climate um, for the symbiotic algae under certain low light conditions. And that brings us back to the color polymorphism, which came so handy in, in studying the function of these pigments. So we wanted to know what the reason for that is. Why do you find two individuals of the same species, one of them expressing substantial amount of pigment, the other essentially none? And we find that not only in sea anemones, so here is my starting picture again, uh, the color variants of the snake lock anemone, so as you can see here, the, the, vo the variety rustica essentially is non-fluorescent, whereas others are brightly fluorescent, some of them uh, only green and others both green and red. And one finds that also in um, corals in a very pronounced way in Stilophora pistillata, where you have a high level expression of chromoprotein or essentially no expression, and the same with various other Acropora species. So this was a work that was mostly done by John Gittins and Cecilia. And we studied in this context the uh, um, coral Acropora millipora. And we looked specifically um, at the red fluorescent proteins 
We chose the red fluorescent proteins because these beasts have a huge area of um, um, fluorescent proteins. In fact, we could clone eight different um, colored um, fluorescent proteins from the tissue um, in the cyan and green region. So, so it's, it's very difficult to separate them apart. And there were also tr three different chromoproteins expressed in the <laughs> tissue. So, um, however, the red fluorescence, um, we only found one transcript. So, and we can also very clearly separate the red fluorescence in the tissue from the other um, fluorescence. So, so, so this is a good um, model to look at because you can then directly correlate the amount of transcripts to the amount of tissue fluorescence. And then we analyzed various um, color morphs with different levels of red fluorescence. And what one can see, yes, again, we, we find this light regulation. So if we um, take the, the shaded parts of the colonies and compare them to the um, illuminated parts, we find that the expression levels are always higher in the light exposed parts. So that applies for all of the color variants. And that is, again, um, regulated at the transcript level. However, what is striking is that um, the maximal expression difference um, corresponds to the visual appearance of the coral. So if you have a brightly red fluorescent coral, um, that indicates that the expression level is substantially higher. So even if they sit in the same light environment, the expression levels at the end are um, about 20-fold higher than in a low pigmented morph. So we looked at the uh, structure of the gene. I don't want to go into great details into that. So, so, so we, we analyzed the, the, the gene structure and also we analyzed parts of the promoter region because we were thinking that this should have something to do with the regulation. However, we were quite uh, puzzled to find that we couldn't see any uh, differences in the promoter region of um, the different color morphs. So, but what we found were certain insertions, certain indels in this promoter region. So there were some which had um, this promoter without these indels and some with. And um, we also found that it's actually not a single gene that is responsible, but it's actually multiple copies. So by doing quantitative approaches, we've we saw that it is at least eight identical copies of the gene that is required to um, produce this high level pigmentation. So because of limitations of our quantification approach, it could be also 80 or 800. So my, my guess, it, it's probably more than eight, but it's at least eight. And um, amongst them, we can then discriminate variants that have these um, modified promoter regions um, as compared to the one which don't have, which, which don't have any indels. And if we plot these, um, the abundance of the gene copies with the um, indel minus promoter, we get a very good correlation with the fluorescence of the um, animal. So what we think is that actually the amount of genes that are actively expressed is responsible for the color polymorphism. So it's not the individual gene, but the amount of gene copies that are actively expressed are um, driving the expression levels. They are all um, responsive to the environment, so they are all regulated by the amount of um, environmental light, but the um, amount of copy numbers that are actively expressed drives then the overall difference in color. So then the next question um, was obviously why does something like that exist? Why does nature decide to produce uh, this variety of, of expression levels? So and again, we um, went back to our um, model Heidenophora grandis, where we have these brightly fluorescent morphs and the essentially non-fluorescent morphs. And we had already established that these pigments serve as um, photoprotectants. So what we did is that we took um, samples and exposed them to various levels of light stress. So we exposed them to, to very low light levels, 
basically at the um, lower end where survival of the calls is possible, so simulating um, the lower end of the dis distribution uh, range. And then we expose them to very high light fluxes that they would experience at the highest parts of the reef, and then some um, medium range. And um, Katrin was monitoring the growth of the calls again over time, so um, this was a long-term experiment where she monitored growth over um, 120 days. And then we can see some interesting differences. So uh, at medium light, so where there's not a lot of light stress, both of the color morphs, they grow equally well. So, so there's essentially um, no real difference between the two morphs. And they grow substantially better than the corals exposed to the high and the low um, light levels. However, if we then go to the extreme, we find some interesting differences. So on the high light, we get a significant increase in growth as com of the, of the um, photoprotected morphs compared to the non-pigmented morphs. So under these uh, conditions of high levels of light stress, the pigmentation becomes beneficial. However, if you go then to the lower end, we found that the highly pigmented morphs were essentially not growing at all. And that could be either due to the um, energetic constraints, so, so it takes a lot of energy to uh, produce these pigments, or due to the fact that they actually take away parts of the light. So under low light conditions where the algae actually become light limited, um, a high level expression of a sunscreen can actually be a disadvantage because it um, further deprives the algal cells from um, the desperately needed light. So, so that can explain why the highly pigmented variants are not growing under low light levels. And here there was a clear benefit for the non-pigmented morphs. So, so we can now um, look at the scenario where we get balancing selection. So um, in the very shallowest part of the reef, um, those corals that are pigmented have a b benefit, they survive certain conditions, whereas at the lower end of the distribution scale, um, the non-pigmented ones are preferred. And these are the two drivers that keep then the different color variants in the uh, evolutionary game. And um, this is then now the the last part um, of my presentation, where I want to look how this can actually help to explain the diversity of um, uh, fluorescent proteins that we see in, the, in nature, and also it may even explain um, parts of the um, diversification of certain um, animal species. So this is a phylogenetic tree of uh, the amino acid um, sequence alignments of different uh, fluorescent proteins. And I want to draw your attention to this very branch. So, so this is where our red fluorescent proteins from Acropora millipora sit. So these are photoprotective um, pigments that they are um, regulated by the amount of incident light. Other photoprotective green fluorescent proteins are sitting in this particular branch and they are from the same species. So even within a species there's a huge diversity in terms of molecular evolution going on. But during our studies when we analyzed these this many transcripts we came also across some interesting variants. So um, when we started cloning these transcripts we found that there were uh, some variants which were very similar to our red fluorescent protein, um, but they were essentially non-fluorescent. So, so this is the so-called um, Amyl CP506 and Amyl CP564. So here you can see bacterial screen, uh, streaks expressing these um, pigments and the uh, Amyl CP um, is a pink chromoprotein and the uh, um, AMLCP506 is an interesting green chromoprotein. 
Uh, both of them have some very, very low levels of fluorescence. So in the Emil CP506, you fa find very low levels of green fluorescence, whereas um, Emil CP564 shows some very low levels of red fluorescence. And that is uh, compared to the um, proper red fluorescent protein, which dominates the visual appearance of this coral. And if we look at the uh, sequence, so, so, so they are very similar, but there are some key differences. So, so this is um, the position uh, that corresponds to the histidine 148 um, in, in GFP. So, so in the highly fluorescent proteins, we find the serine, and that actually forms a hydrogen bond to the tyrosine and therefore uh, promotes the deprotonated state. So, so that makes sense. And um, we can see here that this is changed to, to a cysteine, and that will um, obviously it has a very similar um, structure, but it will not promote this deprotonation of the chromophore. And as a result, um, these uh, proteins lose their fluorescence. We also see some uh, difference in the, in the first residue of the, the chromophore in the green variant, which um, may actually explain this, this particular green um, region. So, and when we look where we find them, they group very close together to the um, red fluorescent protein from Acropora millipora. So they are essentially identical. So, so they are very um, newly evolved chromoproteins. However, we know that um, Acropora millipora has a lot of other chromoproteins, which are photoprotective, which are in some morphs expressed as uh, very high levels, and these are sitting here. So, so in terms of molecular evolution, they are completely um, separated. So, so they are very distant, uh, um, distant relatives in these phylogenetic trees. So that means that the chromoproteins have evolved multiple times within the molecular phylogeny of, of um, chromoprotein, uh, of, of fluorescent proteins. And that may also have something to do with their function. So when we looked at the expression levels, we again using semi-quantitative PCR, we find that in adult um, um, corals, they're essentially not detectable. So, so we, we need many, many PCR cycles that we can actually de detect these transcripts in the adult tissue. However, the work of Eli Mayer um, found that they are um, expressed in relatively high levels in coral larvae. So it appears that these particular chromoproteins, which have evolved very, very recently, may have gained a new function in coral larvae. And that brings us back to our phylogenetic tree. So if we look at the red fluorescent proteins of the Kaede, EOS, FP, also the echinophilia, RFP. So, so again, they are sitting in a completely different corner. So red fluorescence has evolved um, separately. And now that we understand the formation of the chromophore, um, it's also clear that um, the red fluorescence is not really um, an indicator of the evolutionary history. So, so the colors have again evolved many, many times within the um, anthozoans. And if we know now that uh, these uh, pigments are encoded by such arrays of genes, it also makes sense. Because if you have an array of at least eight identical copies and you do not need them to survive, you have a lot of material to play around as evolutionary system. Because if you sit in the reef in the part where you don't need it, in the lower part, if you mutate one of your copies, you're still fine. And um, this is why we are likely looking at this huge diversity of um, pigments with multiple functions, because nature has material to, to experiment and to come up with new um, functions. So the multi-copy nature of um, this uh, group of proteins is likely the uh, reason for the diversity that we find among the anthozoans. <coughs> 
And as a last point, I want to speculate about other functions, because obviously um, not all uh, fluorescent proteins are in, uh, in corals, not all of them are uh, found in um, symbiotic associations. And one example I can show you here from an um, expedition to the Gulf of Mexico um, that was led by Misha Matz and uh, Charlie Maisel, and, and Charlie Maisel equipped the um, submarine with some blue light filters in front of the headlights and um, some yellow filters in front of the camera. And using this to excite the um, benthic fluorescence, we came across this uh, tube anemone, which actually at the depth of nearly 700 meters showed uh, bright fluorescence. So and obviously there's not a lot of light there, so one doesn't need to be worried about photoprotection. Also, anyway, they, these uh, are aposymbiotic um, anthozoans, so they don't um, have sy symbiotic algae, so there's nothing to protect. And that is um, quite commonly found in serianthids. So again, many of them are, are brightly fluorescent. So this is one from the Mediterranean Sea. And if we compare the sequence, we can see that the green fluorescent proteins, they are fairly similar. But then another surprise came um, when um, Shagin and, and colleagues found that also copper pots, so crustaceans, can uh, contain green fluorescent proteins. So one way to speculate would be, has the um, fluorescence another function in this context? So we found the um, pontelid copper pot where you find a sexual dimorphism that is actually underlined by the expression of green fluorescent proteins. And in this case, the males have these very pronounced green fluorescent horns. And um, if one looks at nature, this is kind of suggests that they may use that for signaling, so, so maybe for attracting their female's attention. And um, I'm wondering whether maybe the Anemones try to mimic these effects and um, pretending to be the super male and then luring um, some of the um, copper pots that are responsive to, to fluorescent light into their tentacles. With this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I want to conclude that um, the members of these protein pigment family do definitively have different functions. And if we want to understand the functions, we need to appreciate that there are many of them. So because this was at the beginning of the discussions always the problem that if somebody put an argument for what somebody else could prove um, that there's a counter argument from a different part of the reef. But if we um, look at different reef zones, we can kind of solve these controversial discussions. So the host pigment systems are very fine-tuned to benefit their symbionts. Again, again, this difference differs in the different reef environments and the optical properties of the pigments um, help to structure the communities on coral reefs. I want to thank my um, collaborators for the long years of interesting work together. Um, I want to thank the people of my group who did the work, our funders, and obviously here the organization committee for inviting me. And I'm happy to answer your questions. So in EOS, you showed a, a nice reason why EOS would want to be um, tetrameric. Like there's mm -hmm. there's clear advantages for um, having 
for some complex photophysics that can happen between them. Ha have you seen that for other red FPs? Like, is there a biological reason why they're natural oligomers? Um, that they need to be that way for the coral to use them? Um, what I think certainly for a protein such as Theus red, something similar applies. And um, Rob knows very well about the, the painful uh, experience when people found that there's a lot of green emission and immature um, green chromophores within Theus red. And again, um, their work has shown that there is this very um, efficient thread between the, the green form and the red form. Mm -hmm. And if we look where these discosoma anemones um, occur, again, they are species that prefer shaded mm -hmm. habitats. So, so they are more in um, the lower part of the reef. And so what I assume is that in this particular case, um, we look at the case of parallel evolution again, where this threat conversion of blue light into orange light has been achieved by a different mechanism. So for the ESFP and, and other photoconvertible proteins, um, it's done via this light-driven photoconversion. In DS red, it's presumably through the incomplete maturation or through this alternate um, maturation pathways that you end up with such a perfect thread couple where you have um, green except the molecule in um, proximity of the um, red acceptors. But then for the other um, proteins, it's not entirely clear. M may have to do something with stability so, so that the, the structure is um, stabilized because obviously if um, there is light stress, if there is a lot of excitation, so chances if the, the structure is more rigid um, that might um, prevent some unwanted photochemistry um, going on, uh, prevent that some unwanted photochemistry is going on. <coughs> so I hear you. When in this case, we are specifically talking about um, nutrients. And um, wha what happens is that um, if you have high levels of, of nitrogen in the absence of sufficient amount of pho uh, phosphorus, uh, then the outer cells start to proliferate. And they start to replace, for example, their, their phospholipids by sulfolipids. And that changes their um, photosynthetic um, efficiency under light stress conditions and also under heat stress conditions. So they become more vulnerable to other forms of environmental stress. And as a result, um, they bleach more rapidly. So um, in this context, it's, it's mostly about the symbion and not so much about the, the coral host. Um, you mean the fluorescence of, yes, indeed, it can. Um, and what you saw um, in terms of um, expression in, in areas that are devoid of Sucentelli also happens when the um, corals lose their symbionts. So obviously then the internal light fluxes increase and as a result, the corals can become more colorful. And um, therefore, certain stressful co conditions can increase actually the fluorescence. So, so you showed the, the very nice example of the, the red fluorescence uh, 
allowing the the light to propagate further into mm -hmm. the the coral tissue, and I mean it's very clear that's what was happening, but I didn't understand quite what the benefit was. Is is it because is it to prevent the upper layer from getting overwhelmed, or is there you're just trying to feed the the lower uh, yeah. symbiotes, or what's the reason? So it, it's probably the latter. So. Um, these corals are very flashy, so, so they have thick layers of symbiotic tissue and since the absorption of the symbionts is so efficient in the blue region, they essentially self-shape them very efficiently. And what is happening is that they release their photosynthetic products in the surrounding host cells. So if you have then um, a very efficient absorption in the top layer, you basically deprive the lower part of the symbiont population from light and accordingly the host cells from the benefits of the symbiosis. And if we then also uh, think that transport happens mostly via diffusion, uh, there's very, um, very uh, strong limits to the way these this products can um, distribute it over the coral um, over large distances, so they really need to be produced where they are needed, and this is why we think um, channeling the light towards these deeper lying symbionts gives the um, the benefits to to a larger part of symbionts. Yeah. So, <coughs> so maybe um, starting with the last question, yes, there is light down there. So, so many uh, deep sea organisms are bioluminescent, so and um, many of them emit in the blue um, emission range. So it's not that, um, as in aquaria or, or, or bilia, that you have this breath coupling between the, the blue bioluminescent um, production and, and the green emission but many um, deep sea creatures are in fact emitting blue light and obviously the whole system is adapted to essentially no light. So um, organisms that are sensing light, they are very sensitive. So they will certainly see that there is something going on when um, these proteins are illuminated by um, bioluminescence. But obviously um, that is highly speculative and there's still room to um, do further research. Um, and then your other question was um, oh yeah, the, the yeah, interaction. Yeah, the interaction between the light and the symbiont and how it can be um, how it can propagate and how it can propagate. Yeah. <sighs> well it's it's certainly a possibility. Um, at the moment I um, do not necessarily see how fishes could, uh, so, so they are territorial fishes and maybe they um, are then using the, the, the fluorescent environment to, to define their home range. One aspect is um, this localized expression um, has been interpreted also as a, as a positive function um, to get rid of parasites because there's a trematode worm which infests also corals and if they do that with pruritus then they show this color response as well. So the um, response that I showed for this um, particular um, crustacean and that may then possibly attract some, some fishes because obviously if you can take a bite of the coral um, you get a bit of coral tissue, you get your um, algae supplements, so it's a very balanced diet. But if, if you have then some um, chunky crustacean in between, um, again, it uh, increases the protein amount and, and therefore it may be attracting um, fishes to this particular spot, which then would also benefit the corals because they uh, can reduce their, their parasite load. But 
um, in the first place, it's because the, the tissue is growing fast. Um, and as corals grow, the, the animal has to grow first because so they um, make the structure, they make the habitat for the symbionts. So as the coral grows, the tissue is first devoid of zooxanthellae. And this is why you have this higher intensity of light in this area. And, and this is why you get the pigment in expression. But in this particular uh, case, it may have then also the additional benefit of attracting um, predators to this particular part of the coral. Maybe I have one. Sure. Um, so coming back to the uh, functional role of photoconversion and this green to red threat. Um, Well, there's not so many large stoke shift variants around in nature. So um, the so EKFB 611 has a fairly large stoke shift, but I'm um, not aware that any of the natural uh, proteins have these um, large stoke shifts that we find in the engineered variants. So, Peter, you want to maybe add to that? So, so if you look at our stock shift, it's like four or five variants. Yeah. But the proteins are all different. True. Yeah. True. That obviously that's that's a one, and and in this case uh, probably it's it's about the the energy uh, transfer in the in the bioluminescent system. So I'm, I'm too much focused on corals and symbiotic <laughs> creatures, <laughs> but but obviously yes, that's that's one. But but among the anthozoans, there's really uh, usually a fairly small stock shift. Well, there's a number of um, sensor proteins that have been <coughs> developed, and I think we will hear a good um, deal about them um, during these um, lectures. And um, obviously, there's um, important ones that have been derived from, from GFB, but also uh, the CFPs, they make um, very nice um, sensors, as um, the groups of our colleagues here showed. Um, so, so I, I think there's uh, still a lot of um, new opportunities that can be discovered. Do you want to add? Uh, maybe I can add. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.